I'm extremely happy to be in this conference, first because I'm always happy to be in Marseille, but the, uh, also because it's about random tensors, and I, I'm learning a lot because I don't know much about tensors, in fact. I just fell in tensors by randomly. <laughs> I know more about random, so I'm a probabilist. I'm coming from that side. And um, so I will, of course, what I enjoy here is that I'm learning new things, even new terms. For instance, I had no clue what the injective norms were, was, but now I know, so I will use the injective norm. Um, so let me start with, precisely since I come from the random side, let me start, I, I will show you different things, which in the beginning have nothing to do with tensors. So just bear with me, and then at some point everything will be tensor. All right, so the first question, the first type of question, comes from classical probability. Classical probability, you want to have law of large number, fluctuations, or law of extremes. Right? What is the largest the maximum of a function or something? So here, I want to look at random function. It's a Gaussian function. Isotropic functions. I could call that fields. Right? So, Take a function that will be random, Gaussian, let's say centered, to forget about the, the mean. And you want it to be isotropic. That is, you want the covariance to just depend on the distance, right? So isotropic, what does that mean? You're on the manifold M. Your function F, which will depend on X, X and M, and omega, let's say a random something in a probability space. You want the covariance of F of X and F of Y to be a function, let's say g, of the distance, right? You're on, a, let's say, a Riemannian manifold, you have a distance, and you want to understand this thing. It's a very natural class of problem, very antique class of problem. All right, so the first question is, what, what kind of such examples do you have? All right, so let's take the simplest thing. You take the sphere, and dimension n, okay? You could take the full space if you want, but this is also... So this has been classified a long time ago. What are the possible Gs? Of course, what do you need on G for this to be a, 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 a covariance? You need G of the distance to be a positive type. So it's a, a trivial harmonic analysis question. What functions of the distance are of positive type? So this is, of course, not exactly a modern question. It was, show, it was solved by... Uh, it was started by uh, Bochner, in fact. Harmonic analysis were there. And it was, this one was show, uh, sold by Schoenberg in uh, 42, I think. Okay, so that's not exactly recent. It tells you that this G has to be, G of D has to have this form. So if I'm on the sphere. Sum of AP cosine D to the P. Okay, from p equal 1 to infinity or something. With AP, that's the important restriction, to be non-negative. So that's a fact. Okay, so if you want to understand Gaussian functions on the sphere, the, let's say centered, this is the, uh, the only thing you have to choose, is this G, that is, you have to choose this sequence of non-negative APs. All right? Qu so let's say you look at this, Gaussian function in the sphere. Question here. What can you say about the extreme values of this function? Right? The largest. No. N is fixed here. Oh, convergence of this thing? Yes. You want this thing to converge. The radius of convergence of this series to be larger or equal to 1. OK? So, question one, if, if this would not restrict us very much if you just take a finite sum. Right? If you want to think about just even one term, is already interesting. So question one, what can you say about the maximum of your random function? Right? Or maybe more than that, but for the moment just that. What, what can you say? What's, 
what size, what, uh, what kind of distribution does it have, this kind of thing. Right, so a very, very classical question of probability. When you study probability 101, you start with an IAD sample, you learn the law of large number, the central limit theorem, and then immediately the distribution of extreme values, if you have a good All right, so that's one question. No tensors here, right? Beware, they are there, of course. So second, now another question. Now I take the question like a topologist, whatever. So I, now I take, I want to understand, let's say, random polynomials instead of. So let's say. So in, let's say, an n variable. So let's, let's start with the simplest case homogeneous polynomial. So I want to look at a polynomial H. N, and I want this to be, let's say for the moment, I, I look at it as homogeneous. So of course, it, because it's homogeneous, I can of course look, restrict the polynomial to the sphere. And I want to understand, let's say centered random polynomial. What can I say about them in high dimension? All my n's here are large because they would tend to, they would be large in, later, the moment they are fixed. So what, what, what is a random polynomial? Of course, it's just something of that form. Okay, and then you have coefficients here, that's a homogeneous polynomial, and you choose these to be random. Okay, so that's the simplest idea you can have of a random polynomial, you just pick the coefficient randomly. Since you want to have something simple, you could pick them whatever distribution, let's say IAD, but with whatever distribution, the pick them Gaussian to simplify. So I will call this model, I will put a P somewhere, because this depends on P. So this is a random, the simplest thing you can imagine of a random polynomial of degree P. Of course, here you see the tensor, it's there. Then, okay, so question. You, you can be two, uh, you can do much less, but yeah, it depends what you ask. But for, I will take them Gaussian for the moment. All right, because I, you know, in the end, I want all these things to converge. Every time you have many questions like that, you can make them diverge. So what you're saying, make them diverge. I want them to be the same question in the end. All right, so that's one. Of course, if you, your polynomial is not homogeneous, you could look at a combination of things like this, right? This is an interesting random, so let's say you take a finite number of p's, this is an interesting random polynomial too, which is not homogeneous. Questions, what can you say? So what are the questions here? You could ask yourself the same question. What can you say about the maximum? Or more interestingly, this is a smooth function and a smooth manifold. It's uh, very natural, so to, I mean, very easy to see that this will be generic, this will be a generic function, this will be a Morse function. So you can begin to try to understand what is the topological complexity of this. That is, for instance, you take the level lines, the sub-level sets, the place on the sphere where H is less than something, and what, what, what can you say about the topology of that? And you can compute the Betty numbers of that, the earlier characteristic if you're lazy. Uh, what can you say? And of course, because you know Morse theory, you know that complexity top topology of these level sets is re related, is bounded by computing the number of critical points of these things. Again, the... Um, this function being Morse, it has a finite number of critical points, you can compute. And then maybe critical points with, you know, for instance, you can ask with given index, if you're ambitious, remind you that the index of critical point is the number of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian, maybe with the 
below a given value, whatever. So maybe you can try to understand how this very simple function, a polynomial, behaves on the, on the so that's a different question. Then here's a third question. Does that work? I'm sorry? You know that they are critical points. These functions are Morse. Oh. So, in fact, yeah, you don't, but you're right. This is an interesting question in other contexts where you have flat part. But here, the, here this won't happen. All right, so uh, a third question, which is the one, in, in fact, which made me enter this. Seems to have nothing to do with that. Now this comes from statistical physics, so it's spin glasses. Okay, so what, is, what, what are spin glass models? In fact, mean field spin glass. So you say mean field, you expect trivial, right? Beware, this is anything but trivial. This brought this year the, the Nobel Prize to Paris E, so it's not exactly trivial. But of course, you say, when you say mean field first reaction, it's trivial. So what are spin glass models? I mean, if you, could I explain? I mean, maybe, okay, maybe you don't know, so let me explain. So there are models of uh, you know, magnetic, magnetic uh, materials which are disordered. So what is the natural Hamiltonian, right, of magnetism? It's, of course, the Ising model, right? We know that. So on the graph, it will be this. Let's say maybe you could add a magnetic field if you want. Let's say you're in a box on the graph. Let's just be vague here. And here you want the... Well, this means that i and j are vertices which are neighbors on the graph, right? So that's the Ising model. We understand that, that well on, let's say on ZD. Now, of course, the mean field version of that, so that's the Ising model, where, of course, the sigma are plus or minus one, right? Then, of course, the, the something which preceded Ising of, is, of course, the Cooley Weiss model, which is the, the mean field version. That is, you take the graph to be simply the complete graph. Right? So if you take the complete graph on n vertices, this is, this is a trivial model, which was called, this is an exercise, for first, year, uh, first year probability student, and that you understand well, but it's already nice and interesting, because it has, a, it has the phase transition you want, from an ordered state to a disordered state. What? What exercise? Yes. To understand what the, what the, to understand, so okay, yeah, I didn't ask a question, you're right. So once you have a Hamiltonian, what do you do in physics? You introduce the Gibbs measure, right, which would be exponential minus beta h of sigma normalized, right? And the exercise is to understand either the normalization function, the free energy, Well, 1 over n log z, so what can you say about that? Or understand the Gibbs measure itself, the behavior of the Gibbs measure, and in particular understand that there is a phase transition depending on the value of the inverse temperature. Right? Again, for the Cooley-Weiss case, this is trivial. So what is now the, this is not, these are not spin glasses, they are tri ferromagnetic models. But now what are spin glasses? So you introduce disorder, so you want now disordered random couplings. Right, the interaction up there was ferromagnetic. Uh, of course, the spins want to align, two neighbor spins want to align. So introduce random coupling, so that's the Edwards-Anderson model on ZD. Let's say, on, when the graph is ZD, it's just the same thing. Well, let's say, of course, you do that on the box, etc. But you just put Here, random interaction. These guys could be plus or minus one, okay? Let's say IID may be plus or minus one. But the important thing is that they change sign. 
Okay, so Bernoulli, if you want. Right, so this model here, mathematically and even physically, we understand zero, nothing. Okay. This model is just out of reach. So, something like uh, 40 something years ago, the idea came okay, let's start. Sherrington and Kirkpatrick said, okay, since let's do what, well, that's in the 70s, said, let's do what Curie did and, and just do that same on the complete graph. Right, so mean, take the same Hamiltonian, but instead of ZD, take the mean field version. Right, so that should be trivial. Mean field is trivial. Okay, this has kept us busy since then. So it's certainly not trivial. But, of course, again, so now you want to understand the Gibbs measure. Typically, what is the nature of the phase transition? What's the behavior? For what, how can you compute the free energy? So all that, of course, has been done. There's a huge series of work started with Parisi, Giorgio Parisi in the eight, end of the 70s and the 80s. Okay, so I, I won't go into describing this fully, but there is a, a, a complete picture of what is going on using tools that are very far from uh, not only rigorous, but utterable. So what is the high for this thing? Plus or minus one up there. So it's sigma different I, sigma. So it's sigma equal. Oh, the, all, all sigma is are plus or minus one. So sigma is a vector of sigma. All the sigma is up there are plus or minus one. You could look at sigma as a vector. Then if you look at it as a vector, I have to put, it's on the hypercube. It's h of sigma. Sigma belongs to all right, all this sigma. All right. OK, so no, Sheridan and Patrick, we do understand something. Edward Anderson, we don't. What is written here? Any statistical mechanics is understand the Gibbs measure, understand at, low, at whatever temperature, and understand the nature, if there is, and the nature of the phase transition. The question is, can you, understand, can you say something about the Gibbs measure? OK? And in particular, you hope that there is an interesting phase transition induced by this disorder. So Parisi and, and many other people uh, have produced a fantastic work. And as I said, for a long time, it, it eluded us mathematicians. Because for instance, when you do their replica trick, you have to use integers that are between 0 and 1. We don't know how to do that. But, uh, but now we, after the work of Talagon and others, Penchenko, we, we control a little bit more what's going on here. So that's the, the Arthur Kirkpatrick model. And then, of course, you can, people wanted to generalize. Then there is the P-spin model, pure P-spin model. So it's simply saying, why do you restrict yourself to the case of two-body interaction, you could have three-body interaction. So now, let's say, you would have something like this. On the complete graph, it would be this. That would be the Hamiltonian. Same question. Understand the Gibbs measure for this. Okay. Sure, that's what I'm trying to explain. <laughs> it's, it's coming, of course. <laughs> now, just a second, just a second. So now, this is the P-spin model, right? You introduce simply uh, P interaction, P-body interaction, and these guys will be uh, random. So here I didn't say, but typically these guys are IID, and we will choose them again because we are lazy to be N0. But again, you don't need really that. And here, the same thing. There will be IID and 0, 1. Same question. Understand the Gibbs measure at low temperature. 
the all right so this is again the, the behavior of this is now predicted we kind of understand it not completely but then there was a simplification that came up people realized in physics that it's simpler to study spin glasses but still very rich if you take this configuration space Instead of taking the hypercube, the Ising, the spins to be plus or minus one, if you take it to be on the sphere. Okay. Of course, there is a little twist here. If you take a point which is in plus or minus one to the n on the, ver the hypercube, it's on the sphere, of course, but on sphere of radius square root n. So typically, physicists work with the sphere of radius square root n, whereas topologists will work with radius one. So there will be a, this uh, difference. But it's, of course, nothing. Okay, so same question. So these are called the spherical models. So same, same question. Here, understand, what, is the, what can you say about the Gibbs measure of these guys? All right. So, yeah. Sure, sure. Sorry, I'm really ignorant, but now I can get come up over and over again. So, remind me what a Gibbs measure is. What it's just Z that. Is? Well, I don't know what Z is. Yes, you do, because it's a probability measure. So Z is just a normalizing constant. All right, if you want this to be a probability measure, you have to divide here by the integral of this. Right? Z is the integral. Yes. That's the, no that's the normalizing constant for this to be a probability measure. No, what? Yeah, you take the sum of this. When you're on the hypercube, it's a discrete sum. When you're on the sphere, it's just the integral on the sphere. All right? Beta, beta is a number, and it's the inverse. No, you want to study it for all different beta. Right. Beta is the inverse of temperature. Large beta, low beta, beta equals zero. You see this Gibbs measure is just uniform on the cube. So that's infinite temperature. Beta equal very large, that means very low temperature, right? Beta is one over temperature. But you want to understand, and when I talk about phase transition, is that something happens when the temperature changes, right? That's exactly what you want to do. All right, so. Okay, let me put it this way. You look at this guy, which, for instance, let me put it, let me put it first in vaguely. The, the Gibbs measure behaves very differently at different temperatures. Right? That's the transition. What it is, the spin glass phase transition is extremely complicated to describe. I cannot tell you like this. But let's put it one way. Just the free energy, this is a function of beta. The Zn depends on beta, of course. The limit of that exists and has a very different formula, if you want, when, for different values of beta. Right? So that we will, there is what is called a, a temperature, a spin glass temperature where things change. Okay? Let me put it this way. But forget phase transition. I'm asking compute the limit of this. Right? That's the real question. Compute the free energy. All right. So, in fact, it doesn't look like it, but these three problems are the same. All right. So why? First, let's identify the last two. Clearly, where did I put my, look at the spin glass model, the pure P spin, of course, when you look at it on the sphere, that's exactly my random polynomial, uh, no big deal. Except that here I'm asking a more delicate question. I'm asking about this Gibbs measure at low temperature, whereas what I'm asking here is more elementary. Just, well, in physics, this would be called a zero temperature question. Just the topology of the Hamiltonian, the topology of this function, right? For instance, it's maximum. So in fact, when you want to make the, the link between the two, in physics, everybody's interested in minima, okay? Not maxima, but I put maxima because the injective norm is maximum, right? <laughs> you just change the sign, it changes nothing to the model here. So you're saying that the answer to this question is? Yes. Not the other way. In fact, yes, too, but it's much more work, and I will describe that. Okay, so that's the link between those two things. What about this one, which is, predates this spin glass models very much? This was the 40s or the 30s. This was the, it started in the 80s. 
In fact, if you look at this, take this guy, or the Hamilton here. Now, instead of looking at just at the, as a polynomial, look at it as a function in the sphere. Right? It's a random function in the sphere because these guys are random. It's Gaussian because these j's are Gaussian. Centered because these guys are centered. So this is a centered Gaussian function on the sphere. If you compute the covariance, you find exactly this. One term. The pure p-spin correspond to this, this thing here with only one term. Trivial computation. Just do it. Okay? So the collection, let me put it this way. Here, if you look at the spin glass, the the, the spherical spin glass, which is something of this form. No. Okay. <laughs> if you look at this as a random function on the sphere, call it f if you want, this random Gaussian function, the covariance of this, is exactly this, uh, this g of the distance on the sphere, where g is the sum of cp squared d cosine d to the p. So of course, because it's cp squared, it's not negative. So the class of isotropic Gaussian functions is exactly the, the class of spherical spin glasses, they were invented 50 years earlier. They're also, you know, related to these uh, random polynomials you can, and, uh, in a very simple way. So they're all essentially the same problem. Yeah? Who's asking? What? I'm sorry, I, I can't, at first I can hear you and then I don't understand. I was wondering if the connection one and like uh, No, it's much simpler. You're right, there is that behind, but, but no, but it's tr what I'm saying is that this computation is trivial. You take this, compute the covariance at two different points, right? It's algebra, it's two lines of algebra, and you will find it. Okay? So the, uh, the spin glasses or these random polynomials are in fact simply the same class as the class of Gaussian isotropic function on the sphere. All right, so the question is, and now look, the questions we're asking are, what is the behavior of the maxima or minima? Maybe can, what can you say about the topological complexity of that and so on? Of course, now time to, to put some tensors in. Of course, you see that this function is just the fu this function, let's say, is just the function. Of course, here I'm, I, I will consider only real tensors, no complex, no finite fields, and let's say symmetric. Okay? So this is, of course, the function defined by the tensor J. Yeah. Yes. That's trivial, in fact. That's simple. The, just IID in 0, 1. Yes. Yes. You want a proof? Differentiate twice, right? At a critical point. And you will see that you have something Gaussian. The probability of the Hessian as a zero eigenvalue is zero. Right? So that's, of course, if you had discrete things, it would be more complicated. All right? So, question here find the maximum, understand that this landscape defined by this function may be at the bottom of it to understand the Gibbs measurements. What, where is the tensor? The tensor is here. Now, if I give you a p-tensor, you have a p-spin spherical model or a random Hamiltonian, uh, a random polynomial of degree p homogeneous. In fact, the natural object I, uh, here is not one tensor of, of p-tensor, but it's a collection of p-tensor, you know, equal one, two, three, four, etc. Because you need one tensor per p, right? But the, so what is called the pure case is when you take just one p-tensor. All right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, all independent. Okay, to come back to uh, what we heard yesterday, um, you know, I discovered the objective norm. I also discovered in the talk by, uh, uh, that we had yesterday on the 
you know, the interesting thing that look at what the object could be when p goes to infinity, it, mean, it, it exists. In fact, there is something. There exists a p equal infinity limit to these things. Right? On the space of tensors, it's bizarre, but here it makes sense. Right? That is, here, what happens if you assume, what would be the limit of this thing when p goes to infinity? It will not be a function. It will be a random distribution in the sphere, which is called the, the, the white noise. Right? So the natural object when p goes to infinity is the white noise, which you cannot realize by random polynomial. All right, so what can we say about all these things? So, and you see, okay, now that I've learned the word, if you know how to do that, you've computed the injective norm of your tensor. Right, so the question here, this question is, what is the injective norm of a random Gaussian tensor? All right, so what do we know is we can, I guess. Ah, il y a un troisième tableau? Ah, celui-là, il est derrière, tu veux dire? D'accord. All right, so all these questions are kind of understood now. Not everything is understood, far from it, but uh, the tool is the tool to study all that is called the Katz Rice formula. Right, so the Katz Rice formula, which goes back to Katz, not Victor Katz, Mark Katz. And uh, Rice, that, that was in 39, so you see all these tools are not exactly modern. Tells you, allows you to compute the mean number of critical points of a given index below a certain level explicitly. Okay, so the Katz Rice formula tells you something like this. The expectation of a critical number of critical points, let's say of index k of a random function, a random Gaussian function f, is given explicitly. As an integral on the manifold, here the manifold is a sphere, of something which is very simple, it's the absolute value of the determinant of the Hessian of f, let me call it x, conditioned by the fact that the gradient of f is zero, that f is critical, integrated here against a density that I don't want to describe too much, dx. Okay. So you accept this formula, which is not, nothing mysterious or nothing extremely deep. Um, then you see that understanding the, this number of critical points. I'm sorry? Where do you see a c? Oh, phi. Five. <laughs> it depends only, it's the density. Okay, this is the density at zero, I can write, of the distribution of the gradient at x, okay? So, the, um, so let's look at this formula. Believe me, this is not crucial. That's the important part. Here you have a random matrix, right? Because the Hessian, is a the function is random, Gaussian. This, this Hessian is a Gaussian matrix, sym real symmetric. So here you have a random, the distribution of a random matrix, right? which is simply the distribution of the Hessian conditioned by the fact that the point is critical. You are in the Gaussian word, so conditioning is easy. You can compute this distribution. And what you find is that, of course, big mystery, when your field F is isotropic, then this gives symmetries to your Hessian, which are the symmetry of the orthogonal group. So your Hessian is just a very simple modification. It's easy to see that this is a simple modification of the so-called GOE. It's written there. Okay? The covariance depends on the distance. This is, this is written there. So, in fact, here, the Hessian, in this formula, in this context here, is related to the GOE. So the distribution of the Hessian, in our context here, in the isotropic context, conditioned by the fact that the point is critical, 
is very easily related to the simplest of all random matrices, which is the GOE, the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, which is a real symmetric matrix whose entries are Gaussian, uh, independent. Okay? So once you have this, and there are very many tools for the GOE, you can begin to try to work on, on this. So this has been done. And what do we find? I just mean related. It's the GOE modified by something very simple, shifted. Yeah, yeah. The shift will depend on the, here I didn't put it, but if you condition the, if you look at the number of critical points be, below a certain level, the shift will depend on the level. I don't know complex guys. I don't want to know. In fact, I do, but it's a pain. So. Yeah? No, no, this is, always, this is true for any Gaussian under a certain number of ass reasonable assumption about regularity and all this kind of thing. And in fact, it's also valid for non-Gaussian cases, but in non-Gaussian cases, in s computing the conditional term here is very different. All right, so what do we know about with using this? We know that, now I need this thing. Here's the picture that emerges. So we, we found that we can compute this number of critical points. Wow, how do you write on this wet thing? What? Oh yeah, I forget. I'm, uh, forgot my time in Switzerland. All right. So here's the picture that we found. That there is, if you look now at the, let's, say, let's look at this, the number of critical points, okay, for our random function, let's say for what I call HP, when P is fixed, right? The one that corresponds to a, te a random tensor, a P tensor. Number of critical points below, let's say, the number of critical points of this, let's say below a level of energy U. And this is what we find. So this number, first, is exponentially large in N. The landscape is extremely complex. You have exponentially many, lar many, num many critical points. You have, in fact, exponentially many minima. And now if you fix the level, here is what happens. What is the typical level of of course, all these are theorems. I don't want to write precise things, but uh, to just convey what they say. Your spin glass here, whatever your random function, has mean zero. So the typical value is zero. If you compute with the natural normalization, I would use the normalization of physics, the variance is n with their normalization. So the typical fluctuations are square root n. So typically, a point taken on the sphere is here, and you have fluctuation of order square root n around it. That's the typical point. In fact, what, you, what we find is that the, there is a level, which we call E0 and times n here, and this E0 depends on p, where below that, the complexity is 0. And above that, it's exponentially low. So, and then, you have another level here, so where, which we call E1 of P times Pn. Above this level, you have exponentially many critical points of index 1. And below, you have none. Right? So you have all these, and same thing for higher indices. Then you have a certain level here that I will call minus E infinity of P times N. This is smaller. And above this level, you have no critical points of finite index. All the indices diverge. And below that, you have finite indices. So this is a very detailed information about the number of critical points. But in particular, to come back to something less detailed, where is the, where is the injective norm of the tensor? Here, of course. 
Remember, I'm computing minima, but here minima and maxima are the same thing, right? So this value is, in fact, the ground state of the spin glass. You can prove that. It takes a lot of work. So uh, the annealed computation is done in a work with uh, Antonio Alfinger and, and uh, Yeji Czerny, but it's called the quench computation, and control of the fluctuation of that is done by Eliran Subag, and then Subag and Zaytuni and myself. So all that is understood, and this has do been done in the last uh, eight, nine years. And so this guy here, you can compute using this. This is the place where complexity begins to grow. And this is indeed the, the minima here, the ground state. Of course, with the minus sign, it's your maxima. And the maxima is just the injective norm. So the injective norm of a random tensor is understood. It's this guy, E0P. Forget the N. The N is just due to normalization. Right? And so this E0P, so how do you find this? So let me explain. Uh, maybe I should take this. The, the result here is to understand that the, the, the anneal complexity, so what you can compute is this. That's the theorem. Let me explain what that means. You look at the number of critical points of index k below a level u. I don't need to put a negative here. And this grows exponentially, and you can compute exactly the rate. Right? What? So, in particular, when you take k equals 0, you're computing the complexity of minima. And this function vanishes exactly there. It's negative below this and positive above it. So this tells you that below this level, the mean number of critical points decays exponentially. So the probability that there exists one is exponentially small. It doesn't tell you that it's exactly the, the sharp thing. In order to understand the sharp thing, you have to understand the, this is called the anneal complexity. You have to understand the quench complexity. You want to put this expectation outside. Right? This is much harder. And this was done by Liran Subag in his PhD. Right? But it's, uh, it's understood, and it's the same result. OK, so computing complexity, you can find easily this ground state, which is the injective norm. Okay? And you have an explicit value. And by the way, if you look at this implicit value, how, it, how this E0 of p behaves when p becomes large, you find, this, again, this, the square root of 2 log p that we saw yesterday. OK? Good. So this is, so the picture is, a spin glass is extremely complicated. You have exponentially many local minima, exponentially many saddles of all indices. They are, but the important thing, by the way, that all these saddles are located pretty deep in the landscape, right? Because, you know, they, there's this factor n, right? So you don't have local minima high up. So when your thing begins moving in this landscape, it doesn't find local minima. It takes time to go down and find. All right, now, here's come tensor PCA, it's time. Yeah? The level. You're looking at the number of critical points of your function f, of index k, who's, and when the value of f is below u. Oh. Okay. All right? You're looking at sub level sets. You want, okay? So, I mean, just kind of back to the envelope calculation, we have this gradient f equals 0 is n polynomials of degree n minus 1. So you expect, you know, p minus the n point to a set. So, yeah. So let's take this point of view. I didn't want to talk about that, but I'm forced here. So let's take the algebraic geometry point of view. Uh, here I'm telling you, if you take a random, forget spin glasses and all that, if you take a random polynomial, then its number, the, even the total number of critical points, you can compute it. And in, indeed, it, it behaves, the, the, uh, this thing behaves like something like p minus 1 to the n, which is what you're saying. Then, in fact, so you could ask, what about the algebraic geometry point of view, which is, does there exist? What is the maximal 
number of critical functions. Not, you, don't take, you don't take a random function, you take the worst case scenario. You take what is the worst possible polynomial, or worst or best, whatever. The one that has the maximum number of critical points. Okay, so this has been done by a young colleague I've never met, but did that three years ago. It was Ashof in 2018. And so what did he do? He, he asked the question, not the random, take your tensor, a P tensor, and ask yourself, so when the tensor is complex, you could look at its eigenvectors, as defined by Kim, Lee, and whatever. And you can compute that. And the number of such things has been computed by Stormfeld, and it's, you, you know it, it's P, the maximal number, I mean, the number of eigen, uh, points is something like p minus 1 to the n. In fact, you have an explicit formula, which is a little more detailed. When you take a real thing, the number of eigenvalues of a tensor, are, I mean, the eigenvalues are not necessarily real. So the maximum number is, of course, the one where all the eigenvalues are real. And the question that Kozashov solved was to show that there exists such a, a polynomial with maximal number of eigenvalues. But this maximum number of eigenvalues correspond exactly to having the maximum number of critical points for the function defined by the tensor. So in fact, if you take a random polynomial, which has a finite number of critical points, the maximal number is known, and it behaves like the square of a random polynomial. That is, once, once you take the log, you have a factor two. OK, that answers your question? Yeah, but I still have one more. Yeah. So. OK, uh, there, we won't have much tensor PCA, but. Uh, I, I'm finally catching up on this talk. Yeah. But I still don't understand like, how the, the value u can play a role in, in my mentality. OK, let me show you. That's a function, right? If I draw it, if I draw this level, I have one, two, three, four critical points. If I raise it here, I have one, two, three, four, five, six critical I, points. I, I understand that. Okay. Is there, is there sort of a some algebraic? Why is it like this? It, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now the question is. What is tensor? What is the story about tensor PCA? Come on. <laughs> what? No. Uh, at least for low levels. For high levels, it's a more complicated story. This was done by Iran Subak again. And, um, and it's a hard computation. So now, what is the tensor PCA story? So. Now the question is, has nothing, a priori nothing to do with statistical mechanics or physics or whatever. It's a question of, uh, of uh, pure statistics, estimation theory. The question is, if I give you, a, uh, you, you have a, a simple tensor, and, but you don't have, you know, usual situation in statistics, you don't have access to the tensor itself. So the simple tensor, let's take it to be a rank one. So you have a tensor x to the p, Right? But you don't know x. Right? You, and the only thing you have access to is to this plus maybe noise. Right? So this is a random tensor now. OK, let's say Gaussian again to simplify. This one is a random p tensor, as we had before. Let's say symmetric, etc. And let's say you're doing statistics, so you have a sample of that. Right? And this i is between, one, let's say, 1 and m. That's m is your size of your sample. And the question is, you know, as in basic statistics, can you recover this guy if you have the sample? Right? So you've learned that in Statistics 101 when you have vectors instead of tensor. That's called linear regression. You have a vector, you add noise, and you want to recover the vector, the mean of your thing, easy. So this question is essentially, 
There are different questions. There's the detection question. Then there is the, the statistics, statistical question, or if you want, estimation question. And then there is the computational question. All right. So the detection question is, let's say I've seen this. Can I, is the distribution, is there enough information in my sample to simply detect that there is a signal in it? Right? So you look at the distribution. So can you detect, can you say at least, oh yeah, this thing is not pure noise. There's something in it. That's detection. Once, and there are different variants of that, weak, strong detection, whatever. Once you have detected, you say, oh, this thing is not pure noise. There's something hidden in it. The next question is you want to choose a statistical procedure to estimate it, right? To find, to find the X or an estimator of X. Okay, that's this. Then, typically, once you find some statistical procedure that does it, usually you have to compute. Typically, when you teach Statistics 101, you say, find the, minimum, the maximum likelihood. But in there, you have to find the maximum. How do you find the maximum in a high-dimensional setting? This is a hard computational question. All right? So you have these three questions. So let me say briefly what happens. With a proper normalization, uh, there is a, so let me put here, yeah, so let me assume that this x is, for the moment, of course, you could do many things. Let me assume that I have no information of it on x, right? So the prior, x is just a uniform, it's a point on the sphere, let's say I've, I've normalized its norm. I can always put a lambda here, and I just don't know anything about the direction. So there is a, uh, an IT threshold, an information theory threshold, below which, so here I, I talk about tensors. Just to come back to the first lecture we had here, the matrix case is much simpler. So the, there is an IT threshold below which, uh, I won't explain everything here, no detection is possible. So what does that mean? The distribution of this thing with the signal or without the signal are contiguous. The total variation distance between the two goes to zero. So there is no event that would distinguish between them. So your problem is dead. You cannot do anything. OK? And then when you are above this, Detection is possible. Now you can ask, okay, how can I estimate? So here you can estimate with whatever you want. You can build a machine learning thing, whatever. Let's be modest and let's look at the thing you teach in, calc in statistics one, that is you do maximum likelihood. On what? Yes, 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 it does. It, it, but I, I don't want to know because otherwise I have to be careful about all the normalizations. Okay, so let's say that now I normalize everything so that this is one. Right? Then you take maximum likelihood. So what does that mean? You look at the distribution of this thing and you compute, you look at the density, take the log density, that will be the likelihood. You want to find the maximum. Okay? And so the question is does it work or not? Okay, so what is this thing? If you look at this maximum likelihood problem, when lambda equals zero, which of course would be a stupid model, this is exactly the random tensor question we had before. Believe me, simple computation, that's the same problem. Now, when you have a lambda, it's a different model. What is the, the log likelihood behave like? It's like our random function coming from a random tensor, our p-spin model, plus something like, let's imagine that, ah, I have too many x's. Let me call this one u. Signal is u. 
So you see, it's a random function like we had before, isotropic. But now there is one direction in which the function is different. Okay? So the question is, what can you do with that? So the, uh, here's the picture that comes up. So let me ask, since there are many people here are specialists of cancer, how would you try to detect? I use your language. Maybe you could look at the injective norm, right? And maybe the injective norm. So here, obviously, this tells you in this phase where you cannot detect the injective norm of the thing with a spike or without the spike are the same. But maybe in this phase, the injective norm is not the same. And then maybe you could detect using this, right? So that's exactly what happens. So what you can do is you can compute the topological complexity as before of this when there is a spike, exactly the same formula I wrote before. This was done in, in 2019 in a work with uh, May, Montanari, and, uh, and Nika. And what you learn from there is the following picture. I won't give you formulae because they are horrible, but let me explain what you see. So here is the sphere in very high dimension. Of course, it's a sphere in, not in high dimension on the blackboard here. Let me put you here. The vector you want to catch is here. And that's the equator. You don't know where u is. Right now, you have this random function written here, there. And you want to understand the topological complexity of that. So first, when you are at the equator, right? so when this thing is 0, your function, or near the equator, your function is essentially the old one. So near the equator, what you have is a spin glass, right? a pure tensor, if you want, with one less dimension. So the landscape here is very complex, lots of bumps, terrible, exponentially complex. And here, the injective norm, if you want the maximum, the minimum, whatever, you know. But now you have this term which pushes in this direction, right? So you can imagine that when lambda increases, if lambda is super large, this could change the, the complexity, right? If you have a function which is very complex, but you add something which is very steep, then you will kill a lot of critical points. And this is what happens. So here's what happens. When lambda is less than lambda it, all the critical points are at the equator. Okay? So you detect nothing. And when lambda is larger than lambda it, something happens. You see a band of critical points here. Right? And, the and the minimum, the global minimum, will be here. So the Nope. There's no u, so no. how do you know what the equator is? Even? Yes, but this is what happens. Anyway. If okay. we set lambda equal yeah. to zero, there is no equator. There is no equator, I agree. Okay. But, okay, let me, say, let me tell you something. When you take a point at random on the sphere in high dimension, where is it? On the equator. So there is nothing outside the equator, really. The right picture to this, see, this is not that. This is mis misleading. Oh, right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so now I understand. Yeah, yeah, of course. But that's why I'm, in fact, this is the way you should see a sphere in high dimension. This plain thing is the equator, essentially everything. And these two tiny cups are the hemisphere. Right? That's how you look at it. All right? So now, there is a threshold above which the, the minimum will be here. And when you increase lambda, this thing will go up here. And in fact, the, the landscape, there is another theorem, which has been proved this year by Alfinger, my, uh, myself, and uh, Lee, which proved that when lambda is large enough, 
the topology, there's a phenomenon which is well known in physics of what is called topological trivialization. The landscape becomes trivial. You have only one critical point on this thing. You always keep this crazy landscape here, but you have it here. So this explains for the second question. So this tells you maximum likelihood, which is the stupidest method you can imagine in statistics, is good enough. But then there is the question of computation. Let me just conclude with that in one minute. Computation, it's, it's good to know that the maximum, the injective norm, is this or that. But how do you find the, you're not interested in the injective norm. You're interested in finding, you're not interested in the value of the maximum likelihood. You're interested in where is the maximum likelihood achieved, right? So you want to end up here or here so that you will estimate this u that you don't know. So the question now is you have this random function and you want to find its minimum or its maximum. So there are a million algorithms to do that. But where do you start? You start from a point chosen at random because you know nothing. So you start at the equator. The question is you start at the equator and now you're trying to find the minimum of a certain function, which is let's say here. So how do you find the minimum of a function? You do gradient descent or you do stochastic gradient descent or you do Langevin dynamics or you do many other things. And the problem is that here, the gradient of this term is zero. The second derivative of this term is also zero. So this term is very weak at the equator. And it has trouble pushing the point away. So what we find, and that's how, what, where I want to finish, that here is what we find. If I put lambda like this, if I normalize everything so that the IT threshold is one, Right? Zero, this is the pure noise thing. So remember, this is also the statistical threshold for the MLE, the maximum likelihood estimator, supposed to work from here. But then, if you look at it computationally, there is what is called a computational gap. What you need for lambda in this normalization for the gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent or Langevin or any other local method to work, you need lambda to be very large, p minus over two. So there's this huge gap. In this region, you're supposed to, I mean, the, the maximum, the problem is well posed, but you don't find the maximum. When I say you don't find, of course, in finite time. If you wait exponential time, your algorithm will find it. Then you have other method, this threshold here is l less p minus 2 over 4. And above this, all sorts of other methods work, non-local. So for instance, the one that you may like, it's tensor unfolding. You take your tensor, you unfold it into a very long matrix, okay? and you look, look at singular values of this thing. The singular value of these things are related to the, to the North Pole here, and they are not here. And you have many others. For instance, the classical tool of com theoretical computer science, which calls sums of squares, SOS4. All the algorithms I know stop here, except that some people in the audience here, Mohamed Sadiq and uh, others, uh, tell me that they have tried another algorithm which is well known, which is tensor power iteration, and that it seems to work much lower. I would love that to be true. For the moment, I'm still questioning because the, the end they have is 800. That's, that's right. Wait, 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 is, just a second. So when you take 800 to the power one four, you get five or something. So we still have to, I mean, they still have to check that it's not a finite um, size effect. But the real question, which is open now is, for, it is open for me, maybe now it's closed, but I don't know, that there is this huge gap where it doesn't work, okay? And so each of these things saying that they work here, this is, each of these things is a different paper by different people that I should mention, like Lenkaj de Borova, Florent Jacala, like uh, Okos Jagana, Teresa Gesari, and myself, and all that. Uh, this paper on the unfolding that I just described is uh, with uh, Zhao Yang Huang and Daniel Huang and myself. It was, of course, said, I mean, proposed by Montanari uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, 
But for the moment, this gap, at least for me, is not filled, right? And that's, uh, that's open. If anybody has a, an idea on how to do that, that would be great. Okay? Thank you very much.